Beautiful. Yeah. Friends, we are here not only live on uh, Facebook, on Marvin's Facebook page, but I have here at moreguitars.com uh, the incredible guitarist, Danny Rabin. Thank, Thank you. you so much Thank you, for stopping Whoa. by to see us today. <laughs> that was a nice catch, by the way. I know. Instance yeah. of a cat. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, you're on tour now, I know. Uh, I am. Indianapolis, first stop last night. Evansville yeah, great. tonight. 150 people yesterday. That was really nice. Today there's going to be snow, but I'm hoping for at least 4,000. So. Oh, yeah. 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 We're going to do our best to see what we can do there tonight, <laughs> if the place will hold 4,000. We'll yeah. See. The Boneyard, yes. lots of bones. <laughs> Mojo's Boneyard, and then uh, you've got, you're heading south from here, luckily get out of yeah. that snow apocalypse that we've yeah. got coming tonight. Alabama, the home of fusion. Yes. Tomorrow, Huntsville. <laughs> <laughs> you can't laugh in the middle of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but anyway, we, we're just so glad to have you here. The thing that anyone who follows you mm -hmm. on social media knows how generous you are with your music, with your time. Um, I'm getting something out of it too. I'm kind of an attention whore. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> okay. Well, you're I, getting my attention. Yeah. And you're obviously getting about 100,000 other people's attention as well. Yeah. So no, hopefully no, I mean, it feels good. No, it feels great. Um, you know, a lot of people, I, I have a theory that, that people that don't have something to give uh, that's worthwhile think that like the act of giving is selfish. But, you know, and in a way it is, but in another way it's like, for me, the thing I care about deeply, like, you know, all bullshit aside, is playing well. And a lot, teaching allows you to find new words to express old ideas with that, may, that, that kind of shed a new light on them. And a lot of times, I teach on Skype a lot. I have a lot of students from the feed, you know, they're just kind of like, mm -hmm. I want to study with you one on one. And then we just start talking on Skype. And sometimes they're frustrated because what, what happens is, um, you know, I'll have a lesson with them. And 45 minutes later, I'm kind of giving away what I just gave to them, to everybody. But I wouldn't think about those things if their questions weren't so good. Right. You know, right. so it's like we start talking about something. To explain it to them, I come up with like, you know, just a way of, of sorting it out and or like simplifying it or like you know cutting the bullshit away from it to just kind of put it on the guitar and and make it like digestible and then I share it with everybody but it's like through teaching you know one on one really I think you you start coming to terms with the with the tools you're using to play this music and um you know the live feed you know right now we have this live feed going and like an actual interview so i love you guys but i love you guys more uh <laughs> you know so and and you know so the live feed uh it's just been great for me because it's really a place where you know i get to see what kind of what kind of things that i can uh, i guess reduce to the simplest way i can present them you know carry over and I know from shows, a lot of people come up to me now and they're like, you know, I learned this, I learned enclosures, I learned this. It's, it's an amazing time because in one way, the world of art and music has never been dumber, you know, because music has just been reduced to, you know, to the, it's sim simplest thing, you know, Justin, I don't even know who's the Justin Bieber of today, I guess that's five years ago, but just like the most basic stuff is out there and really prevailing. And at the same time, I have all these people that are learning about Django and learning enclosures and learning how to play these complex chord changes and improvise, you know, through moving harmony and stuff about Indian solfege. So for me, it's just been really encouraging to see that there's a real starvation um, coming from the people that actually just want to learn about how to improvise, how to play well, how to get to know the guitar on a deeper kind of level, you know? Yeah. I, I've seen that, and one of the things that, that really impressed me and that I got something from from your uh, live lessons is your attention to right hand technique, your attention to rhythm, um, yeah. and it, it's something that's really lacking in what I think a lot of young people are getting from online lessons. I mean, personally, I could care if I never hear another arpeggio sweep in my life, <laughs> uh, I'm into phrasing, I'm into melody. And you sure. really, uh, everything from 
uh, finger positioning on strings and ways to support your picking patterns with the rhythm you're trying to produce? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, just, it's kind of like a twofold question because it's like, one of it is focusing on the right hand, realizing that like to play guitar, you are half note selector, half drummer. You know what I mean? And this hand tends to be an improviser. Like when you're playing stuff, when you're playing your blues stuff, a lot of the, a lot of the freedoms that you feel are really which note to land on, right? Like mm -hmm. this hand is really improvising a lot, but this hand is not so much of an improviser. It does what it's told and it does what it knows. Like you, you, sometimes you see like somebody who can't really play that maybe like, you know, chooses a note that like at the right time sounds amazing, but you never see somebody who can't really play just execute a 30 second note run out of the, you know, it's just like, oh my God, he got so lucky. It's, it would like, it, it's so silly, but it would never happen. It's because this hand doesn't do anything you don't program it to, right? It's a ro right. it, it, you have to roboticize it. So you're talking and, more muscle memory in well, right just, hand technique? You have to be intentional with what you do. So if, and, and I think it starts, like the, the first step in that journey is about realizing that there's no such thing as fast and slow. That's amateur talk. Real talk has to do with pulse and subdivision. If I, we, we relate the rhythms we play to time as we feel it, to the steady places where we feel time at, that's the pulse. And past that, we're just chopping time up to equal pieces. So if we want to play fast, it could be like, you know, like and then how you kind of learn how to work with that mentality through through that mental space of dividing time. If you divide it to very small units, then you're playing dense, you're playing fast. If you divide it into like, you know, quarter notes or eighth notes, you're playing slow. But it's about shifting your thinking into that part. Now, I said it's a twofold question because the other part of where I pay attention to and uh, the things I pay attention to that are specific maybe to gypsy jazz and so, uh, you can't say that anymore. G word jazz. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Uh, Seriously. So, uh, what? Seriously, there, that's an issue now? I mean, it is, but uh, I'm just giving people shit because I don't uh, care. I, I uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, some people always, like, you know, they. Uh, <laughs> we, had a, we had a comment the Marvin Strike back yesterday, uh, and, and he said, like, you can't use that word anymore. And we wrote, like, how dare you jip us of the word. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, yeah, so, but the other, I think it's about realizing that any motion that you're using is coming, like, you know, every, any motion that you're studying is something that has to do with posture and with how you hold your hands. And that's not so much like, you know, when people say right hand, left hand technique, they talk, they're talking about like what roles they play and what rhythmic values they, they come. But to me, a thing that's also interesting is where your emotion stems from and how you're holding your body. And from a really early age, I, I, me I remember when I got the, I, it was Hot Licks or one of those, like the Ingve Malmsteen, REH, I think. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, I got the, that like VHS tape and I was just looking at his hands and it was so, I realized immediately how different he's using his body, how differently than I was, because I was bad at guitar and he was great at guitar. And if you're going for a sound, anybody, Stevie Ray Vaughan, B.B. King, Eric Clapton, uh, Clapton, it's like, that's the first place you need to look. Because if the, the way people are holding their body, the, 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 the way that like, you know, the, the places the motion comes from, that usually is the key to everything. That's like, you know, if you're going for like a Stevie Ray Vaughan, and Vaughan thing and like, you know, you, you need to kind of throw your wrist, right? right? It's like if you're going for a Django thing, you definitely need to ask yourself, what angle does the pick hit the string? Those things are hard to figure out, but people are so attached to whatever their technique is. And most of them didn't even select their technique. It's just some sort of like physical default, right? It's right, like, yeah. it's just like, this is how I pick, you yeah, know? That's true. Yeah. And it's like, it, it doesn't make sense. There was no thought put into it, but people will hold to it like, you know, for dear life. And um, for me, it's like, that, that's a thing where you really need to like, learn how to let go of a lot of your bad habits and just try something new to get better. And a lot of times it's really painful and people aren't willing to do it. It's called being anal retentive. It's when babies try to hold to their 
shit so because they feel like they're melting away you know but you gotta you gotta change your shit that's what i'm saying wow yeah well you, you obviously have the heart of an educator i mean it's obviously very important to you uh do you you were a student at berkeley in what 2003 is that correct that's exactly correct okay yeah um how different is your style of imparting the information than what you would get yeah. in a structured oh to totally different it that's what I assume. It's kind of blue. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't good. You right. know, um, I had some good. I had some teachers that told me some good things, but in general, it was just. I mean, look at the people who graduate. Most of them sound terrible. Hmm. You know, it's like some some people sound good, but most of these people sounded good before they got there. Or it's really hard because if you're measuring yourself between the like the time you spent there. That's also the age of like 18 to 22 for most people. That's sort of some formative years for any player. So I don't know. I mean, I never had the opportunity to compare what I would have been like practicing in my room from 18 to 22 in Berkeley. But I mean, it's not bad. They give you the same kind of information. But most of the time there, I was in a, I was in a free jazz band. We were just making noise, like banging on pots and pans. And it was like a, it was an insecurity thing because a lot of people um, kind of went through their jazz training before they got to Berkeley, and then they got there and they like were hang out and they'd have like I was I wasn't one of those like people who was great when I was like you know in my late teens I kind of sucked at guitar and I hated when everybody I didn't want to go out and play gigs because I didn't want to be heard because I knew I sounded bad, and I knew if I practiced a lot, I'd sound good, so I was just gonna like, let's wait to sound good, right? Mm -hmm. that, there's no shame in that. If you sound bad, you shouldn't go play gigs because people aren't gonna like it because you sound bad. It makes perfect sense. Just practice till you sound good, then go play gigs. But anyway, a lot of people kind of sounded okay and you know, would have a good time playing with each other. And uh, me and my friends who couldn't play jazz for shit, we were riding that postmodernist train that's really popular right now. We're like, oh no, it's like we're playing like prepared guitar. And, <laughs> you know, and like doing all this sh like weird shit. And because people are so confused about sounding modern, all these people just ate it up. They like accepted it. You know, we were like a cool band, just like making, like, you know, and I know what was going on in my, I wasn't some like artiste, you know, we were just f***ing around, it was fun. You know, we thought it meant something, but you know, after a while it got old and we jumped on the jazz train and really learned how to do it, you know? One of the things, the, the conversation keeps coming up. Someone will make a comment and, and it then becomes a topic again. Is rock music dead? Is guitar music in general dead? Well, and I feel like with rock music, like since like 1971, there's always like 20 bands in each town trying to bring rock back. <laughs> it never went away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like we're bringing real rock and roll back. Um, I don't know. Is it dead? I mean, there were never too many people who were good at anything. Like, you know, it's like when jazz was the most alive. It's like how many great jazz players were there like that played actual great solos? But like 100 in history? Yeah. How many great rock bands were there? 50? I don't know. It's like, you know, was it ever alive? It's like, it's just weird to think about it like a style that was once affluent. There was just like badass people then and there are badass people now. And there's always going to be very few. You know, I just don't, I don't buy that it was ever like alive or just like you would walk down like the East Village and every place was an amazing band. No, it was just like some bands were amazing, some bands were shit. You know, it's, it's the same. Whenever I look at that in in perspective with, with say, classical music. Mm -hmm. To me, in my way of thinking, the only reason classical music exists is the fact that it has an educational structure and a performance structure that is in place to ensure that that music is passed on from generation to generation. And I see that to a smaller degree in jazz, but in most other forms of music, I don't see that the that there is, and you know, maybe some people think, well, you don't have to be that educated to play rock and roll, but still, yeah. to do anything correctly, that educational structure is so much, it's such an important component of it. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the free market. I think they should let classical music die if it's going to die. It's like if people aren't willing to go out and pay for it, then people shouldn't play it. I mean, I don't think that we need to, you know, 
I mean, museums have a role, but I think if you take if you take the, if you push those kind of ideas to the extreme, then you create a really perverse hierarchy, where you know, like a violin, a second viola player is going on strike because it's like, damn it, I want a hundred and thirty thousand dollars this year, not a hundred and twenty-five. <laughs> This is subpar, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, do you hear about the CSO going on strike? It's like, dude, like you're making six digits playing violin. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a, you know, so, I mean, you create a funny thing with these non-for-profits that, that are propping things. And in jazz, it's creating a monster because the, the committee, you know, once you start trying to preserve jazz, mm -hmm. you know, instead of like actual have peop you know, pe having people who are great at it, I mean, these committees, like we never get into like any jazz festivals because fusion isn't like cool, you know, but like what is cool is some like saxophone players like changing colors, shrieking like, wah, wah, you know, and it's like everybody in the committee is like, yes, that is the sound of pain. And it's like, yeah, it's like, I feel the pain too, it sucks. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like, when you get like non-for-profits, they're structured like committees. People decide about the programming of these festivals. So it's not all roses. I mean, if, if people actually paid with their, voted with their money for the jazz they liked, then you'd have badass people dominating, you know? And I mean, that's, that's the game. Since we were never invited to all of any of those parties, l listen, I'd change my tune if like I was playing like, uh, I don't know, North Sea Jazz Festival, like, and somebody gave me 20 grand to, like, go on stage for five minutes, you know? Yeah, I'd be like, oh, you know, the world of jazz is perfect. We should, we should <laughs> preserve it. <laughs> jazz needs to be preserved, and we should all pay for it with our taxes. But <laughs> since they're not giving me any of that dough, f*** it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to sell tickets and play fusion. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I personally, and I know a lot of people are glad that that's the yeah, path you chose. But I don't it. pretend that if they gave me some of that money, I'd change my mind. You watch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to talk just a little bit about, uh, for people, you know, for, for people on our channel, uh, you, again, I'm going to tell you, you really need to, uh, to follow Marvin online, social media. Um, you have... Taken, I mean, obviously, when I was talking to Danny Markovich, mm -hmm. from the very day one, you have kind of decided that you are going to be in control of your business, you're going to be in control of your music. Yeah. Um, is that a necessity today if you want to be original? No, we wanted to sell out. Nobody would buy. <laughs> we just didn't have a choice. You know, we're not like sexually, like incredibly attractive. Maybe pretty. No, okay. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it wasn't in the cards for us. Nobody wants to see, like, you know, two, like, Jewish guys in their 30s because they're hot, you know? It's like we had to play well and, it's like, and sell tickets because nobody would fuck with us. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, there was back, no option. <laughs> back in the days before you were born, when I was in high school and I was burning up Mahavishnu Orchestra and Return to Forever and, yeah. and all this stuff, I was always shocked that one year after the Beatles broke up, after they had, you know, dominated the charts for a decade, Columbia Records is pushing this band that played the weirdest music anyone had ever heard. Right. And they found their audience. Yeah. Why aren't people doing that today? Um, Why is there no support for artists to help them find the audience? Well, Frank Zappa has a pretty good explanation of that, and he says that the people that used to run record labels in the 60s and 70s were basically oil people, business people with like a cowboy hat, and you'd go to their office and you'd be like, I want to try something, and they'd just be like, okay, if it's like, if it doesn't make any money, you're out, you know, and you're not getting another chance. And then it was that, that you know, that, that generation died out, and, who, and the people that took over were the people who thought they knew something. The executives, the people that like would carry the coffee into the office, slowly climbed the ladder and became the man. And then they're like, no, no, I know what the people want, right? It's like, and what did they know? They, they don't know anything, right? It's like they know what they, when you start assuming what the audience wants and making, making art from that perspective, that's exactly when everything starts going to shit. 
because the artist doesn't know what the artist wants. The artist just writes something that he hopes is good, right? It's like that he thinks is good in general. It's not like I'm going to ask myself the Larry's favorite kind of guitar solo, go into my imagination, try to fish something out that matches that. No, I'm going to play the way I like to play, right? That's the only way that that's going to work. Now, what these ex this is, it creates a chain reaction that leads all the way from like Wham to the Backstreet Boys to fucking Justin Bieber to whatever like baby music people are listening to now. Because people just assume, it's like, oh, like, you know, it's like, if, if I, wait a second, I, I fed the steak, but steak costs a lot of money to make. Like, why, why wouldn't they just eat a burger? Oh, a burger? I'm going to have a McDonald's and soon enough you're eating shit. <laughs> 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 That's exactly what's happening. It's so simple. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, but before I could talk philosophically with you about the music industry all day, but to satisfy some of our guitarists in our audience here, I wanted to hear a little bit about the evolution of your tone, or has there been an evolution in your tone? Uh, well, it's gotten much simpler. You know, uh, I used to play with like a lot of pedals and kind of a complex setup. And now I have literally like I have a hundred watt head with two channels, a strat with nothing going on, just single coils and, um, you know, single coils and a hum canceling thing, a sewer one. And then, you know, I play with like two pedals in the front of the amp and one pedal in the loop. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So I have a boost, an overdrive and a delay in the loop. I even took the tuner out because I just, at a certain point, it happened when I started playing a lot of acoustic guitar for fun, like learning the gypsy jazz stuff. I started understanding what I'm looking for in terms of response from an amp, which I didn't really understand very well before. Um, and that really like, you know, before that, it was, I don't know, I had heroes like Alan Holdsworth, Scott Henderson, and was really hearing this kind of like fluid tone that had to do with maybe some sort of digital processing and compression and all that. And there was a certain kind of thing that my right hand over time was learning how to get out of the guitar. And if you put too much cable, that thing disappears. It kind of becomes yeah. a different kind of response, a different instrument, spongier or something. And um, yeah, so now it, was, it became a process of taking things out, right? And what I really wanted to do is just, you know, find a, figure out a way to really take a lot of stuff out of my chain to like make, make the sound as pure as I could. And also, you know, the, the musical situation I'm in, uh, I'm playing a lot with a saxophone and, uh, you know, like it's like saxophone, bass and drums. So what we do is, you know, he has a dry sound that's acoustic, so my sound kind of became more matching to that, you know? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And we talked to you. I know that your time is running short here yeah. as well, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. I just wanted to reiterate what we had talked about before. Um, I thought it was very, to me, one of the things that struck me was your use of single coil tones mm -hmm. in the type of music that you are, and it just... It gives you a level of expressiveness that I haven't heard fusion players achieve with humbucking. It, it was really simple just because Stevie Ray Vaughan was kind of like the ideal tone to my, for electric guitar since ever. Like that was just always, it seemed like the top, you know? And it was just something about, I can't, exp I always exp explain that idea. Like the visual image it gave me was like chomping on a piece of metal. Like each note is just, I, I, I could just see it. I don't know, like I'd hear a solo. And I, <laughs> I would literally go like that. Like, you know, that, so there was something about that thing that I was always looking for, a kind of snap for the clean sounds. And then for the dirty sounds, just something smooth, more maybe Scott Henderson, E. Holdsworthy. And I play through like a custom audio electronics OD100 that's just Fender on the one side, Marshall on the other. And that seems to give me the tones I need, you know, for now. It's what I what I figured out. Well, Danny, you have been so generous of your time here today. I know you've got a gig to get to. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in. Danny Rabin with the band Marvin. Follow him on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Marvin Music. And band, no, MarvinMusic.BandCamp.com to buy shit. Yep. And subscribe to us. 
moreguitars.com. Subscribe to our channel. Like us on Facebook. We'll see you next time. Maybe Thank we'll you. Play out. Huh? Everybody's asking you to All play right. Out.